So how do I choose a subject for my paintings? Well, I always make sure that it's a subject that I have some sort of response from or some rapport to, because it's important that it's something that I find exciting and that I can make something of. So I love boats as a general rule, and I just love landscape as well. I paint all things, landscape, still life, portraits, but I, I, I particularly like boats. So why do I like boats? I like boats because they're not a static item within a landscape. So quite often in a landscape we've got mountains, trees, buildings and those sorts of things that are essentially static apart from the atmosphere. With a boat it's always moving, it can be twisting, they change shape and they change size. So as they bend with the wind, you get different aspects from them. The water they sit on, that's moving. The reflections they make are moving. So for me, it's trying to capture that moment of movement and that excitement within that landscape. So when we are confronted with vast landscapes and we need to narrow those down to an interesting play of shape, I really love working on site and when we work on site we need to pick a fixture. So by that I mean a post or a tree or something that isn't going to move as one side of that picture. And then we can just project to the other side another fast or solid object. Um, we need to pick a range that is the same format as our depth of field or our view. So, I like to work on site, but what I've got with me is a photo. So how about we have a look at that and I can show you what we mean. If we have a look at this photo, as a photo it tends to work. But can you see, we couldn't really translate this as a painting. You could to a point, but it would be a lot of sky to fill in. And in a painted area, this can become somewhat boring. And I love skies, however, it's too much of a rest area when we have that much rest area in the water. First thing to establish is what's the format of my canvas? Is it portrait? Is it landscape? And what are the proportions? Then we need to have a look at what areas can we include or exclude of the photo. So can you see if I nip down this sky and just have a whisker of the bridge, all of a sudden the dynamics of the whole picture start to change. And for me, that is a lot more interesting than this. Because to me, this is giving us clues as to what's happening rather than stating the obvious. So what I'm going to do here is show you this back to about here. And let's say here. Because what I've done is actually done a painting of just this much of this photo. So let's have a look at that next. So this is the format of my board and this is the area that I've chosen. Now before I show you the painting I just want to go over a few little elements of why I didn't do it like this. Can you see how this is almost cut off in two sections? So we have this bottom piece and a strong horizontal through here and lots of movement up here. I want to try and avoid that so that we keep the viewer interested in the painting. We're trying to create pictures that people walk back to, not paintings they walk past. So can you see how this keeps the viewer more involved and that the general elements have a nice play of shape to them. So that's why we've kept these strange little shapes up here, even though they don't tell a full story. Okay, so let's have a look at how we interpreted that. So here's the finished painting, and here's the photograph that we started with. So can you see that I've taken an area of this? Now if I was there on site, so if I was painting plein air, I would have chosen this post and this post as the start and finishing point. Remember me mentioning that it's important for us to pick a static piece and a static piece because they're not going to change. These will move with the wind and with the tide. These things won't. So once we've got elements that we can refer to, we can then start to put them down. We don't have to do them literally. Can you see that I've used the general shapes and composition 
to create a lovely play of shapes. Now, the other tricky thing here is, watch what happens if I cover up some of those shapes. Can we see that in here, there's no way that our brain will interpret this as boats. It's just a mishmash of shape. And also, similarly, if we have a look down here, there's no way that our brain will translate this as water on its own. But together, our brains will read it as water and boats. Now it's doing that for a few reasons. One of the reasons is that we have this strong horizontal here. So we translate that as a pier. We don't need it as a tight pier. And in fact, in the photo, we can't see it as a tight pier. So if we can't see it, don't paint it. The other thing is all this mumble jumble of shape in here is this mumble jumble of shapes here. The tricky part here is to understand how to translate that from here to here without being too tight. The other thing is to make sure that as loose as this is through here, we need solid objects to also be as loose. Had this bridge have had very sharp edges, it would not be in sync with the rest of the painting. And it would look like somebody else had painted that part of the picture, or that that part of the picture was painted at a different time. So it's important to get the, a rapport with our subject matter number one. Once you enjoy the field of view, learn how to translate it onto your canvas. Once you've translated it, make sure that it's coming together in sync with each other. And the final thing is that all paintings work for the same reasons, whether they be abstract, realistic, or halfway in between. Have a look at this quick little exercise. If we think of the whole area of being light, medium, and dark, one of those needs to be dominant, and two need to occupy about the same surface area. So can we see here, Everything is almost even, so it looks like a pattern rather than a painting. But watch what happens if we introduce some other shape and some other confines. Can we see how by introducing a bigger shape and where the light areas occupy a small area and the darks and the medium occupy about the same area, the play of shape tends to work better in the mind's eye. So again, if we introduce even further, can we see how it establishes a better play of shape yet again. Even though there's no consequence to what those shapes are, this is not as good as this for all of those reasons. Our brains crave rest areas, they crave a discord in shapes. So if we have a look at the overall painting, if we have a look here, the darks, and the lights occupy about the same surface area. And the medium, so if we change it to a black and white picture, the medium tone is very large. So it doesn't matter which of those is small or big, but so long as there is that change, your painting will work. It's a bit like when we fiddle with a painting and it starts to look good, look good, look good, and then look bad. What is it that brings it to that crescendo and what is it that kills it? and it's usually the change of those tones. So look out for those when you're painting and just enjoy the process. Happy painting.